we're going to have a manned mission to Mars. I think no matter how we get there, be it nuclear, ion propulsion, whatever, it's going to require that rather massive amounts of material be moved from the Earth's surface to at least a low Earth orbit. And by massive, I mean in the uh, tens of millions of pounds. Now, if we do that with the shuttle or with any kind of a vehicle which uh, costs as much to off payload as does the shuttle, which runs somewhere in the neighborhood of $4,000 a pound or better, it's very unlikely that we're going to have a Mars project because we're talking a major fraction of a trillion dollars. It might be possible to get the taxpayers that excited, but certainly not in this day and age. So it seems to me that one of the first problems we ought to attack is to get the cost of the Earth orbit transportation down. Now, we've, we've done a lot of talking about it getting it down. So far, we haven't succeeded. The shuttle was supposedly an effort in that direction. It was the prime justification for building the shuttle to replace the Saturn V. And, uh, Somehow it didn't work out that way. But if you take a look at the, the cost of space transportation, it seems to me that what people have been working on the hardest is the propellant. You know, you look at a rocket that sits on a pad, the payload, a little bitty thing way up in the, in the front end of it, usually in the front end of it, and uh, the rest are great big tank and great big engine. And they say, oh, God, it's an inefficient thing. We've got to get uh, the amount of propellant produced. Well, the cost of that propellant is only about six bucks. Propellant required to put a pound of payload on orbit with even a rather inefficient vehicle is only about six dollars. So you don't want to work on the cost of the propellant. Perhaps indirectly, as it affects other things, Yes, it would be nice to have a smaller rocket. But uh, I'd say we shouldn't get carried away with that. Uh, as it affects the cost, uh, as the size of the, the amount of propellant affects the size of the hardware, uh, there's certainly a cost effect there. Although it's a lot less than most people believe in a lot less than most formulas account for. Could we have a next? We all know when you go to the store and buy cornflakes, they have the large economy package. And you get more cornflakes, the bigger the package. Of course, the package costs more than the big package costs more than the small package. But if you need an infinite amount of cornflakes, you better buy the biggest possible package. Now this, uh, I have a, some assorted slides here which apply to a number of different things uh, just to try to illustrate the variation of cost with size. Now this happens to be solid rockets. <coughs> and you see it roughly, you can get a tenfold increase in size for a twofold increase in cost. Uh, we have to be very careful about this cost data to make sure it's all plotted with the same assumptions. And the best cost data is that which is for the same contractor in the same time frame with the same set of specifications and so on and so on and so on because very many variables can come into the, the picture. Next uh, slide, please. I can't believe that one because it's too near to a log log, straight line log log thing. Okay, how about tankers? We have run the gamut, a tremendous uh, gamut of size on tankers. Uh, we see that if you only, if you want to build a little bitty 30,000 ton tanker, this is dead weight tons at the bottom, it's going to cost you uh, pretty nearly 30 cents a pound. And if you're building a little bigger goal, even out to uh, 200,000 deadweight tons, the cost per pound or per ton is still coming down. 
I use this because uh, the rocket I'm going to propose is as close to being a tanker as anything else. Next slide. Now, there are a lot of things involved in any program other than uh, the cost of the equipment and the cost of the fuel. There's the cost of the operation. However, uh, I, like, I like this curve because it's, uh, it, the width of the brush is roughly consistent with the accuracy of the data. Uh, can you move it this way so we can get the vertical scale on here? This is the launch cost, the operating operating cost, as a function of the size of the payload, which also is a function of the size of the vehicle. And in general, you can see a that the launch operations become a smaller and smaller fraction of the total cost the bigger the vehicle is that you're dealing with. Uh, next one. The results of these basically uh, are confirmed in this curve, which is put together from uh, well, reasonably comparable data on present day launch costs. And you can see, if you want to launch just a few pounds and use a scout, your cost per pound is astronomical. It goes off the chart. Uh, people talk about uh, small, light, cheap, etc. vehicles. It doesn't work out that way. It's just the reverse. Uh, the cost per pound, if, if you have a number of pounds, and the man Mars mission, you have, relatively speaking, an infinite number of pounds that you want to put up. So you have a great uh, deal of payload. The bigger the vehicle, the lower the cost per pound. For the time being, uh, we perhaps should avoid uh, uh, not look at these down here, they are. <coughs> these are actuals, and these are projected. And that's, it's always the case that the projected cost is less than anything you've done today. You know, fools don't lie, but lie, or, or figures don't lie, but liars can figure. And I don't believe any cost figures, including my own. I've never seen a formula yet that included such vital factors in the cost equation as the brilliance or stupidity of the program manager. And they sure come in all sizes and shapes. But it's not the kind of thing you can factor in until the program's been done. At any rate, this shows that uh, pretty clearly that as the size of the vehicle goes up, the cost per pound goes down. Next one. Now, with any other transportation system, if we were to throw it away every time we use it, it would be uneconomic. <coughs> Yet that is basically what we've done with everything except the shuttle. We designed it to be used once and thrown away. Now I pointed out that it's not the cost of the propellant that is doing you in, it's a almost trivial fraction. If you use, at least if you use liquid oxygen, liquid kerosene, uh, kerosene or liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, the cost of propellant in today's market is a completely trivial part of the total. Uh, it's the cost of the hardware and the cost of the operations that break the bank. Okay, the cost of the hardware, as I've indicated, has something to do with the size of the hardware, but our studies have shown that it's much more keyed to the complexity of the hardware, to the number of parts rather than the size of each part, because each part follows that same overall curve. Uh, that this is reasonable uh, stems from consideration of what goes into it. Uh, for example, if uh, you have any part you want, uh, it takes the same engineering, it takes the same, assuming now we're talking about geometrically similar parts, uh, 
the same uh, calculations, the same drawing, the same uh, engineering overhead is identical for a big part as it is for a little part. Uh, laboratory tests, for example, if you have to make laboratory tests before you can build your part or after you build the part, uh, that's more uh, often the function of the size of the testing machine uh, than it is the size of the final product. So you will find that uh, a very large fraction of the total cost goes into items that are invariant with size. Uh, but for every part that's in the system, you have to have a drawing somewhere. At any rate, uh, as a result of uh, the studies that we made this years ago now, we concluded that the, the route to a low-cost launch vehicle was to make it big, make it simple, and make it reusable. Now, of course, everything in engineering is a compromise because there's always more than one way to do the job. But uh, by and large, uh, you know, you have to. Uh, it is. It does you better to accept some penalty uh, in having to increase the size of the vehicle. In other words, if your payload to weight ratio suffers. Uh, a modest amount by a sim simplification. Go for it. Don't try to wring the last ounce out. Now, of course, the development cost is also important. And the way to bring the development cost to zero is not to develop it. Uh, if you are convinced you, say, need a bigger vehicle because of reasons I've just stated, uh, you'll have to develop it. But it says do the minimum amount of development that you have to do. Don't push the state of the art in any direction. Do that before you settle on the vehicle. Don't do that in the vehicle program. At any rate, uh, when we get down to the question of reusability, uh, I don't think any minor tweaking of, of the way we do things, the way we have done things in the past, is going to make a lot of difference. I mean, if you're looking for a tenfold reduction in cost, you don't uh, try to come up with slightly better castings or uh, improve the machining process a little bit or uh, whatever. You don't do a minor tweak. You do a major change in philosophy. And one of the ways, though, the very powerful way of cutting the cost, much more powerful than uh, designing uh, New production, using a new production method, for example, is to use it over again. Now, you can go astray. The primary justification of the shuttle was, well, we're going to use, reuse uh, uh, two-thirds of it or four-fifths of it or something like that, and that will bring the cost way down. Well, right off the bat, you took a beating of three to one in payload weight ratio, in spite of all of the, uh, the uh, new ground that was broken in engine efficiency, uh, the payload to weight ratio, or the liftoff weight to payload ratio of the shuttle is 65 to 1. In fact, I think it's never been, never actually been that good. Uh, the payload to weight ratio for the Saturn V is about 24 to 1, and that's the best that we've ever had. Now, you could maybe, by using carbon uh, uh, tankage, you know, uh, using the latest in technology, you might squeeze it down to half that. But that's only going to cut the weight of your equipment in half, and chances are it's going to be more expensive for power. But again, on a first cut basis, if you reuse it twice, you cut the cost of the hardware in half. If you reuse it 100 times, you cut it by a factor of 100. And I don't see any basic reason, since a liquid rocket is just a collection of machinery, you can't make it last uh, a thousand times here. But certainly at a hundred times, you're, you're, you have made a major uh, reduction in the cost of hardware 
and I see no real bar to that. At any rate, uh, our conclusion was if you want to get low cost based transportation, uh, you stick with the low cost propellants. Uh, you don't actually, the solids go up a factor of about 70 in cost of propellant, so it then begins to become significant. Uh, and you keep the hardware as simple as you possibly can, and you reuse it. And you make it as big as the job, the job demands. In other words, you make it big, you make it simple, you make it reusable. Now, this is a design of a rocket uh, uh, originally designed for a manned mission to Mars. It was designed back in uh, about 1962, 61. Uh, it's two stages to orbit. The first stage is LOX kerosene. The second stage is uh, LOX hydrogen. And uh, it had one engine per stage. Absolute minimum number of parts. There are no turbo pumps on it. It's pressure fed all the way. You use a very low pressure upper stage to get a real high mass ratio. And you use a, a, a gadget called expandable nozzle to get a very high area ratio. Uh, area actually just exceeds the diameter of the stage by quite a bit. But this uh, rocket will put uh, 1.75 million pounds on orbit per shot. Now it's a big rocket. Uh, 75 feet in diameter and it's 600 odd feet long. Uh, the Saturn V was a big rocket. It was bigger than its predecessor by a much larger factor than this is over the Saturn V. But we did it. In fact, increasing the size probably was the easiest thing we did. The next slide, please. There is a problem with getting rockets this big. They won't fit on the railroad. You can't transport them by road, railroad. You can only transport them by water. Four billion, the most enormous airplane the world has ever seen. But if you transport them by water, in fact, if you look at them as a ship, say, so treat this thing as though it were a ship. It's actually a very sturdy, very rugged, very buoyant. When it's not full of propellant, it is a very buoyant ship. When it is full of propellant, it's still quite buoyant. So the a operating mode suggests itself that you build it uh, in a shipyard or in some facility that is, has access to the uh, open ocean. And you then tow it with a tugboat from where you build it to where you want to launch it. You service the dockside. Uh, you tow it out, erect it to a vertical uh, position, and launch it right out of the water. You don't have to worry about the real estate. The real estate is free. Uh, instead of having to take up half the state of, of uh, Florida to get appropriate safety circles for this thing, you just tow it out another couple of miles to sea and you've got it. You are also in the right position to recover. Now, I don't know, I think there were too many aviators in the loop when they built the shuttle. Uh, I've always felt that the sh shuttle was miserable in concept, marvelous in execution. To get that thing to fly the first time was really a tribute to the know-how of the fellows at Rockwell. But to use, to put wings on it, to make the thing an airplane, for the last 10 or 15 seconds, I say it's ridiculous. Uh, they got the payload the, between the ma provisions for it being manned and the p provisions for it being uh, reusable, in other words, the, the wings and the tail and the landing gear and, and all that. They got the payload by factor three, and then that's a big loss to take. Uh, coupled with the fact that it turned out it was not completely reusable, they still had to throw away the the biggest part of it, the so-called external tank, external to what, I don't know. It is perfectly possible, if you recover in the ocean, to get these things back with a weight penalty, not two-thirds of the total recovered weight, but with a weight penalty in the order of 5% uh, of the total weight, possibly even down as low as 2%, with a parachute or a drag device. Uh, we show here an inflatable 
toroid, which in addition to uh, providing enough drag so that you can withstand the impact without damage, uh, it also keeps, uh, it turns out that these things penetrate only about halfway into the water and then they fall over. And it keeps the water out of the engine part compartment completely and protects it against any shock of, of hitting. So even though if the engine were fairly fragile, uh, it should not be damaged in a recovery of this kind. In this case, both stages are to be recovered. Only one has to come through the thermal thicket, and that's the smallest one. Uh, the first stage uh, only goes 200 miles downrange. For that, you rent a tug, and it, if it takes you a week, you have to pay the, the tugboat company $15,000. Which again is a trivial part of the total uh, of the purchase price of the thing. So your your recovery costs are negligible, and the design penalty you take because of the uh, recovery provisions are also extremely small. Next slide. Here is another uh, attempt to show the overall concept. Uh, we have to, can you move it uh, to show this corner to start with? Slide it up, 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 a little more. All right, here, down here, I don't think you can see that pointer, can you? Uh, this is a, uh, a lagoon scooped out down at the Cape where you, with a lot of slips, if you have several of these. Uh, they're prepared uh, in these slips for uh, launch, the mechanical preparations. They're fueled, uh, unfortunately, also off the screen, right over there. There's a fuel supply. You put the fuel on it, you take it offshore, and you load the oxidizer, partly because uh, when you have the two of them together in such tremendous quantities, there is a chance for a great big explosion. So you don't do that until you're, you've gotten whatever required safety distance you need out to sea. Then you tow it out further for the launch, you erect it by flooding ballast, and you launch it directly out of the water. The first stage only goes 200 miles downrange, and it can be retrieved for something in the order of $15,000. The second stage goes on orbit, uh, jettisons its payload in the right orbit, comes back and is deorbited so as to land essentially at least within the same 100 mile radius circle. So that perhaps by that time in the same tug you can go back out and pick up, pick up the second stage. It does have to make several orbits before it gets into the right position again. Next slide. <coughs> Now people always say, oh, it's so big. I had a letter from NASA which they compared it to the Washington Monument. <coughs> True enough, it was as big as the Washington Monument, but then the Washington Monument only cost $3 million. So what's that got to do with the price of beans? Uh, here you see it alongside the carrier Enterprise, and we can't even get the Enterprise in the picture. Uh, the, as a when viewed as a shipbuilding endeavor, it's the equivalent of a very small tanker. And when we went to shipbuilding people and we explained the, the structure of it, they said, mm, well, it's actually symmetric. We can weld do all the welding downhand. In fact, we could probably machine weld everything rather easily. Uh, we only have uh, two radii of curvature to worry about. You've got hemispheres uh, and, and cylindrical sections. All in all, is it, except for having to we qualify some of our welders and the added cost of the, the mar aging steel which we're using as a, compared with uh, uh, 1020 or whatever they build ships out of these days, uh, it's no sweat. We'll build it for you for $6 a pound. Well, that was many years ago, it's gone up since, but uh, at the same time when we went to the existing airframe industry, you 
know, these tanks are made of steel three quarters of an inch thick. We can't form that. It was absolutely a no, uh, no go. It was a mismatch. They said, you can't build a thing like that. Shipbuilders can. And they can do it for $6 a pound. Well, that's probably five times as much now. But it's still a uh, very, very reasonable price. Uh, next slide. So it isn't all that big by the shipbuilder's art. And if you go to the shipbuilder, this is one of the concepts for building it that one of them came up with. Uh, they were assembling the whole thing and they got a, uh, they sort of made a big lathe so they can uh, turn it right at the graving dock. No, this is actually a side launch, range for side launch. So all they need is a certain uh, number of feet of frontage. Next one. There's one problem with trying to demonstrate the uh, characteristics of a great big vehicle, especially when you're trying to do something that hasn't been done before. People want you to, well, a big vehicle costs big money. So they want you to demonstrate it with a little vehicle. The trouble is, well, here's a little vehicle we set out to demonstrate it with. The problems are at least 10 times as bad trying to demonstrate it with a little vehicle. The little vehicle goes all the way under the water, for example. Uh, the little vehicle has to have fins on it, which the big one doesn't have to have. Uh, the fins tend to break off after, <laughs> when they go into the water and, and if you hit sideways. At any rate, uh, we finally succeeded in, in uh, interesting the Navy in the concept. And uh, we have been uh, working on a program called Sea Liar for the past several years. Uh, the, one of the earlier steps is to, uh, to fly this thing we call the X3, which I built, as you can see, in my garage. Uh, I'm not quite sure what it'll prove. We've already proved that you can watch rockets out of the ocean. Uh, let's see if that's the next one there. No, at any rate, uh, ultimately, of course, we have to show that this engine will light off underwater. And uh, so you might as well start out with a seagoing uh, test facility. This is a 365-foot barge, which the Navy was going to scrap. And so between the time uh, they declared it surplus and the time that they planned to scrap it, we got the use of it, essentially free of charge. Uh, here we're shooting a small rocket, which I showed you over the side. It's actually, that uh, uses uh, the little Atlas Vernier engines. Uh, Rocket Dyne LR-101s. We group four of them together around a single propellant valve, and we just fire over the side. Best flame disposal means you'll ever find. Not only is it flame disposal, it's also noise disposal. If you lower it to within a couple of feet of the water, there's no noise at all. You can't hear it 300 feet away. It goes blah, 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 blah. That's it. <laughs> I can hardly wait to fire a, a couple million pounder underwater. See if it makes any noise. And next. There's a picture of the, the John Schmidt, which we named it after the fellow who found it for us. And uh, here we're firing it. We, we actually find out that when you fire into the water, it makes some, so much steam you can't get a good look at the flame. And the only reason for looking at the flame is PR. Uh, but if you want to get a good picture of the flame, why well, you have to move it up the higher deck, which we did in this case. Here, next one. Now this shows what happens when you fire just above the water. Uh, in this test, this is a 20,000 pound thrust engine. It went bloop and then complete silence. Because the spray which is kicked out, uh, apparently the droplets absorb the sound. 
on your bad hair. We also ran a, a number of other tests, simulated launches, where we, we, we tested it 30 feet down, then we went and brought it up, we went away and left it for a week, we came back, we did nothing to it except fill it with propellants again, lowered it, fired it up again, we did that three times in a row. The servicing was zero, well, except for the putting them, uh, refilling it with propellant. There was no fix, uh, repairs required. Of course, it didn't go through the landing uh, side one. In that program, we never got a chance to do it, but we are hoping that we will uh, be able to demonstrate the complete launch and recovery cycle with the, the X series of vehicles. The next one. And of course, people want to know, will it fly out of the water? Well, here's, this is a modified Aero B, which we call the CB, oddly enough. And you can see that when it floats in the water, it floats almost vertical. Not that that's important, because you have a self-correcting guidance system in it. You don't really need to worry about that. And currently, our plans to tie it into the, uh, the global positioning system so that we get the accuracy not from the accuracy of the initial alignment. It doesn't really matter so long as it's pointed more or less up. Also, as you get bigger, the uh, uh, motion of the vehicle becomes less and less until when you get to something Sea Dragon size, it's almost zero and very close to the vertical. Okay, next one. We, uh, on this rather small rocket, we launched it, we re recovered it, we refurbished it, we relaunched it, and the uh, turnaround cost was just 7% of the cost of buying a new rocket. We thought for the first attempt that was pretty good. Now, we've also completed a series of tests on uh, a vehicle very similar to the X3, the drop test vehicle, uh, which you see here hanging from a helicopter. And if and the next one, I think you can, uh, yeah, you can see it. Well, it's still there. We can, we can tell that from the picture. The tank is undamaged. It was retrieved at 200 feet per second. Now, the theory said we can go to 300 feet per second without major structural damage. Uh, we did learn that you have to be careful about the side loads, and you have to tie all the plumbing down securely. We didn't do that as well as we should have. But as far as there being any damage to the tank whatsoever, uh, there was none. Yeah, here's the... This is a before shot, I guess. Uh, the drag bags, instead of being a Taurus, we found we didn't get enough uh, lift out of the toroidal Again, that's something that is unique to this, uh, to the small scale uh, approach. So we used uh, four bags, also they were cheaper to make, and we had to put some fins on it to get it stable. We, first we brought it in with a 3,000 foot belly flop. It was un unstable at the first attempt. Surprisingly enough, the tank survived even that. It hit with a 300 G deceleration. But if you, uh, the impact in the surface is conical, the G's go down by an enormous factor. Next time. Now, unfortunately for some tests, we need to have it absolutely vertical. And this shows a, uh, our X-series vehicle rigged out in a completely vertical set up. We need this as final checks with uh, autopilot and everything installed. Next slide, if we have any more. That's the end of it. At any rate, uh, turn it off, if you will. A uh, recap just a bit. We feel that the way to cut the base launch cost is 
not to make more sophisticated vehicles, to make less sophisticated vehicles, to make them big, make them reusable. And we are going to try to demonstrate as much of that on a small scale as we can. And we're going to, of course, do analytical work uh, to try to ensure that this small scale data is applicable to much larger vehicles. Uh, the Navy is interested in a, a vehicle of about 10,000 pounds payload. And if we can just get the Congress to keep appropriating money, which is currently a problem, uh, this, uh, we lost our favorite enemy. And I'm afraid all the defense work is going to get cut back. But at any rate, if the, we, we actually have private financing, which I think is going to take over uh, if the Navy uh, is not able to. And let's see, we have 10 minutes left, I believe. If you have some questions, yes, sir, back there. You say you're going to build a uh, 10,000 10,000 pounds for the Navy, it's about that we're looking for. To orbit. That's 10,000 pounds to a polar, low polar orbit. It's a small machine by your standards. Yes. yes. But uh, I gather that the Navy is more interested in the sea launch aspects of it than they are in.
some of the key practices you mentioned, uh, reusability, uh, common, common union of the uh, cars and structures. Uh, haven't the Russian government been using that practice for a long, so a long time aside for an aspect of reusability? I'm not aware of the, uh, the, the only rockets I know of that have been reused is the shuttle, the parts of it, and uh, the, uh, the X airplanes, X-15, and uh, all the rocket-powered airplanes have been used many times. Plus, on the test stand, well, I'm personally associated with with an engine that accumulated something like 17 hours of test stand time on one end. Uh, but again, it depends on the details. Uh, tubular engines, some designs of tubular engines have a limited fatigue life uh, in the tube. I am told that uh, one crack they don't pay any attention to, that they get five or six cracks, they put scotch tape on them, and at, uh, at 10 cracks, they scratch it and they replace the engine. But I, I don't see any fundamental reason why a reusable engine that requires no servicing for 100 flies uh, is not possible. There's nothing to wear about. Understand the scaling factors. 
then go ahead with your finger. Although, if you apply seagoing techniques to the development of big engines, you find the cost comes way down. They are all, uh, taking this thing out to sea and firing it. You know, the free real estate, the free uh, protection, uh, the capability to move your big test setup to the industrial base and then out someplace else to get the isolation uh, makes a big has a big impact on the cost of developing big engines. Thanks a lot, Bob. 